I'm Helen Gorman, and I'm a volunteer uh, at the Historical Society of Carroll County, also the library chairman. And I've also written local histories of Tawny Town, and um, edit, edit and taken part in some some of the um, other publications that the His Historical Society has published. Um, Helen, describe Tawny Town as the oldest town in Carroll County. Um, the first land grants. Um, in this area were taken up by land speculators, mostly people from southern Maryland, and one of these was John Diggs. John Diggs owned a lot of land in this area. He owned Diggs's Choice, which was kind of uh, across the Mason-Dixon line and on this side, and of course there was a big dispute about that land. Um, he owned lots of uh, lots or land grants in this vicinity, and he owned this 60-acre lot that was called um, Brothers Agreement. In 1744, he deeded it to his son Edward and his son-in-law, Raphael Tawney. And um, they bought the surrounding unclaimed land and ended up with 6,900 acres. And that was the beginning of Tawney Town. Raphael was the one that laid out the town. And uh, he laid it out along... Um, what is now 194, which is a north-south route, and um, the east-west route, which today is uh, 140. Um, back in those days, the 194 was a part of the Monocacy Road that went from um, Hanover to uh, Frederick, and um, it was a, there were several parts to the Monocacy Road, but this was one part. Um, in other words, there were several branches. The, um, the north, the east-west road was uh, a kind of, um, it went from Tawny Town to Uniontown to Westminster. It was kind of a roundabout way. Now, that was the way that the English settlers, the Scotch Presbyterians and whatever came up from that direction. And um, the Pennsylvania people came down the Monocacy tr Trail or uh, the Monocacy Road. Um, the taverns, um, when he laid out the lots, um, they were half-acre lots, and um, they varied in price. Um, the person who bought one had to erect a house that was 20 feet by 24 feet, and it had to have a stone or a brick chimney, and that had to be done within a year. Um, if they didn't do that, then they could be fined or they could lose their land. And when they bought a lot, they still had to pay, in order, they paid for the lot, but they still had to pay taxes to the Calverts, and they still had to pay what was called a ground rent, which was in perpetuity for, uh, for, for the original owner. In other words, if it was owned by Raphael Tawney, it went to him. Um, later on, um, uh, in the 1700s, Raphael Tawney sold his unclaimed lots and some acreage to um, Jacob Good, and he took over the selling of the lots. Um, the taverns um, on lot one, which is um, where what we call the Central Hotel uh, building, uh, which was on the corner of uh, East Baltimore and York Street, that was the one that was owned by Jacob Good. Across the street from him on the southwest corner, um, was um, the uh, lot three, which was uh, Ulrich Hoover. Um, that that tavern was a stone tavern, and it has we've seen the the uh, date stone on that building. It's still around 1760, so it was built before um, the actual um, uh, town was wrote shortly after the town was laid out. Um, over on the other corner, the uh, northwest corner, um, there was a, uh, another inn by, um, that was owned by Philip Fishburn, and then on the corner uh, opposite there, um, there was another tavern owned by um, Hoover, a man by the name of Hoover. I think he was also a tailor. Um, the inns, um, not all of them were the same. I guess some of them could accommodate uh, overnight guests, but some were just merely like uh, 
Fishburns was a tavern. Um, the one that was on um, Hoover's was, um, he was a tailor too. Um, it was also a place where people could um, buy and sell things, um, pro 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 produce, or um, it was also a place where, where the justice of the peace might hold court. Um, it was a place where they held elections. Um, Adam Good was the first postmaster, and so the inn that he occupied was probably um, a post office. Just describe the taverns that were opened on each corner of those. Square. Yes, there were taverns in, in lot one, which was the um, corner where now the Central Hotel building is. That was owned by Jacob Good, and that was probably a log structure. Across the street from him, on what is now Frederick and East Ball, or corner of Frederick and East Baltimore Street, was a rectangular fieldstone uh, inn or tavern. And that one has the date stone of 1760. It's the oldest building in uh, Tawnytown. Uh, across the street from that would be one that was um, on Frederick and West Baltimore Street, would be the one that was owned by Bonner. And it probably was log. And um, Bonner was also a tailor in addition to being an innkeeper. And across the street from him on the side that would be York and West Baltimore Street um, was the one owned by Philip Fishburne. Philip Fishburne's lot was divided uh, very shortly after he bought it. And Eli Bentley, who was our famous clock, clock maker, owned part of that lot. There were four taver the taverns were on the four corners of the uh, town that was laid out, and uh, they were some of the earliest buildings that were erected. Jacob Good had a brother by the name of Adam, and Adam bought Lot 8, which was down the street from, um, which was on Frederick Street, um, what we call Frederick Street. Um, when the, the visit of Washington and Martha was reported in July of 1791, Hugh Thompson was the innkeeper. And uh, of course it's reported that Washington stopped overnight and um, supposedly had a, a, an enjoyable meal of mush and milk. And um, then um, Martha's reportedly to have taken out a uh, from her reticule uh, stocking that she was knitting. And um, of course the, the story is that, and of course they left the next morning. Now the table on which they ate their meal was handed down um, through generations um, into the McKellop family. Now what is what became of it, I don't know, but we do have a record of the different people that owned it at one time. And then did, was it a legend or true that he, um, upon he, having dined there, he said, damn fine tavern? That that was reported, I think, in his diary. This was a diary entry. Uh, it can be documented in his from his diary. Tell me, what was documented in his diary? This, the, state the, 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 the fact that he stayed at the Adam Good Tavern. And yes, I think there was a, a, a reference that uh, he did uh, make a, a comment about this about the sign, the A was uh, distance from the D-A-M, um, which made it uh, kind of humorous. This was not Washington's first visit, though, to Tawnytown. There were others. Describe how uh, Tawnytown became a farming community. Uh, well, an outlying area, uh, a lot of that land that was bought up by the settlers that came through here. Some of them didn't keep on going south, they stopped here. And um, th of course it became a farming community. Now the town, I have to say, because it was a farming community, there were many craftspeople that started businesses in town to accommodate the farmers. And you would have people like barrel makers, saddle makers, harness makers, um, um, pottery makers, um, brick makers, uh, blacksmiths, many, many, many more that um, started their crafts uh, because the farmers needed uh, these things in order to uh, survive. So I would say it became a, a center for uh, business in that direction. Okay. At, at any point were there um, mills or, or Yes, uh, there were mills. Um, 
the blacksmiths, I think, were the most numerous. They seemed to be about um, every on every road, um, and, and there were many mills around. Um, how early the mills came, uh, I don't have a date, but there were many in the Tony Town area. And what kind of mills? They were different kinds. There were uh, grist mills um, and other types of mills that uh, um, that the farmer would need. And were there canneries? Here? Not that early. Okay. And canneries at all? There were canneries later on. They they would be later on in the 1800s, where when you had canneries, because it, uh, if you remember, uh, there's references to um, during the Civil War as to the fact that there were a few cans canned goods that the soldiers had, but canneries, I wouldn't say, were early, the earliest type of industry. Okay. Okay. Was there an African-American presence in town? Uh, yes. Um, there, uh, I think in the 1790 census, there were something like 16 black slaves, um, but they said that number could include indentured servants, so I'm not sure how many were black. Um, the Keys owned slaves, uh, Bernie's owned slaves, there were people in town that owned a couple, but they weren't uh, that numerous. It was more uh, free and indentured servant type uh, uh, situation. Were they uh, kind of well taken care of? Were they treated? Yes, well? very well taken care of, uh, especially the Keys. We have a lot, a lot of documentation about, about the Keys taking care of the Blacks, um, they had prayers with them every night before they went to, to rest. Uh, there's a key sem a slave cemetery. And um, when Francis Scott Key, uh, d uh, before he died, he wanted his, he left his, the Terra Rubra to his wife, and he was, um, wanted her to make sure that she took care of some of the slaves that were still there. Okay, great. Um, uh, briefly, just talk about there was a munitions plant here. Yes, um, uh, around the time of the Revolutionary War, there was a Mr. Destroyer that had um, a munitions plant. Um, it was a, described as being a long, low frame building. It was up on what is now York Street. Um, in addition to making um, guns, he made uh, shovels and hose, nails uh, for the people. Um, it burned down, and he went over to Harper's Ferry to continue his business. There was another man by the name of Knight who also um, manufactured munitions. And he had a son who, be who became a doctor and is credited with being the father of orthopedic surgery. Wow. <laughs> um. So let's uh, get into the uh, Clotworth Bernie family. You can start wherever you want and go right through if you like. Um, the Clotworthy Bernie family, um, the first Clotworthy Bernie came in, in 1810, and he came to manage um, Runnymede, which was in the state of about three, over 3,000 acres for his uncle, Dr. Upton Scott, who lived in Annapolis. Um, and when he came to um, the Tawnytown area, he lived for a time in um, rather a log-like structure over on what is now the Glenburn Farm, which is part of his uh, property. He farmed part of the property and, and rented out the rest of the land to tenants. Um, he, uh, he didn't really know very much about farming, but he's credited with... Um, um, having a di a different pl types of plows and thrashers made. Um, one of the, I think, the most outstanding thing about uh, Clot Really Bernie, 1810, is his correspondence with many important people in the state and uh, in the country, and also um, he was connected with the Keys and the Tawnies, and um, his uncle lived in Annapolis, and they owned land down there. Um, he corresponded with many businessmen in Baltimore, corresponded with people in Ireland, kept journals, kept all kinds of records of what he bought and sold, 
and from his journals we can find out a lot of what Tony Town was like when he was here. Now, he had a large family. When he died, he left Glenburn, which was the original property that he built his first house on. He eventually came over uh, to another part of the land and built a house that he called Thorndale. When he died, he left Thorndale to his daughters, and they started a school for girls. He left Glenburn to his son, Rogers, and he started a school for boys. So they're credited with doing education in this area. Um, Rogers' son, uh, Dr. Clotworthy Burney, uh, practiced in Tawny Town in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and he is the person who wrote the history of Tawny Town. He was the first president of um, the medical, Maryland Medical uh, Society, or not the first president, but I think the first person from Carroll County. Um, he was also served a term in the House of Delegates and, of course, wrote this history of Tawny Town. His brother, George, started the Bernie Bank in Tawny Town, and his other brother, Rogers, became, uh, went to West Point and um, spent his entire life as an Army person. And when he came out of the Army, um, he was one of the founders of the National Geographic Society. Um, then his sisters, um, Dr. Clotworthy's sisters, took, um, kept house for him. All of these people, all every generation, kept records. And the Maryland House, house of, uh, Hall of Records deemed these records so important that they micro put them on microfilm. They came to Tawny Town. And uh, this, the last uh, uh, great-granddaughters of the first Cotworthy Bernie still had in their possession all these diaries and journals, and they were all microfilmed and put on um, film. And we have copies of them at the, at the Historical Society. Uh, Rogers kept journals. All the girls kept journals. Um, the girls that ran the schools uh, kept records of the girls that went there. They ran a correspondence with aunts and relatives in Ireland that are very interesting. Um, they had um, the, um, the, the one, one of uh, Clotworthy Bernie's sons, uh, uh, Clotworthy the lawyer, um, had a son that was in the Union Army in the Civil War. And he wrote many interesting letters to his aunts about his experiences. Um, so e even though uh, Francis Scott Key was he was born and raised at Terra Rubra, but uh, that was part of Frederick County at the time. He was about 58 when Carroll County became a county, um, and so his homeland became part of the county as well. Just describe his importance and contributions that he made to Tawny Town. Well, uh, he, he and his father, his father, his name, so I father is John Ross Key. Start at the beginning, and I just need to hear Francis Scott Key so oh. I know who we're talking about. Uh, Francis Scott Key's father was John Ross Key, and... Uh, he, he was important in Tawny Town in the beginning. He was in the Revolutionary War and Oregon. Uh, they considered Tawny Town their hometown. And Francis Scott Key uh, came to Tawny Town many times. And um, he's credited with starting the first Sunday school for Negroes in the Tawny Town. He often taught in Tawny Town in the Sunday school. He gave land for... Um, uh, uh, I think a church, and I think the building was used also for a school in the Keysville area. But um, he was well known, and well liked in Tony Town. Represented some uh, local citizens, and uh, when it came to law uh, lawsuits, so that was his. He was well known. Francis Scott Key's sister Anne uh, married um, Roger Brooke Tony, who be later became the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Um, they were married, um, he was Catholic and she was Episcopalian. They were married at Terra Rubra um, in 1806, I believe. And uh, their, their marriage record is in the marriage books at St. Joseph's Catholic Church in Tawny Town. Okay. Um, how did the arrival in about the uh, 1871, how did the arrival of the Western Maryland Railroad affect Tawny Town? Um, the town up until that time only extended about, um, I, I think, um, for example, 
from the square down to East Baltimore Street to what we call Benner's Alley or Riffles Alley. Those lots were half acre lots, and that's a half acre from uh, from let's say that Central Hotel down to Riffles Alley. That would be a half acre. Um, from the Stone Hotel down to Benner's Alley would be a half acre, and the town only only extended down East Baltimore Street to about that um, about that those places before um, when the railroad came in. Um, the people that owned Antrim sold off some of their land, which extended up into that area um, of the town, and it was they were bought up by local people, and houses started to be build, built. I believe I read somewhere where there were about 68 buildings that went up when they knew that the railroad was coming in. Um, then after the railroad came in, um, all along Baltimore Street especially, the people that owned property there uh, began to um, make the the um, facades uh, brick, or um, they improved the looks of the property. And from that, we get the look that we have today, which is um, the Pennsylvania German influence and some Greek revival um, architecture. But that started when after the railroad came in. So the railroad was really a big, important um, factor in the development of the town. There was both freight and passenger service, and um, later, later on, um, the freight. I know of uh, some of the merchants uh, got their uh, things that came in. Some of their merchandise came in by railroad. Um, of course, there was um, products that from the farms. That went out, and, and now you t the canneries um, would have shipped their canned goods by railroad. It also became um, the post office uh, pickup. The mail came in on the trains and um, was brought to the to the post office. Uh, I think twice a twice a day in the morning and in the evening. Mail went out, mail came in. The service continued through the twenties. Um, I believe the passenger service stopped. Uh, earlier than the freight service. Um, but the freight service uh, would have been used by the canneries especially. Uh, the, well, the railroad doesn't isn't owned by the Pennsylvania, but um, there is a railroad line. The Midland Railroad comes through here and uh, does freight business. Okay. Um, so just moving right along to the Civil War, um, just describe the effect of the Civil War on Tawnytown, um, kind of including that most of the towns seemed to work, uh, fight for the Union or fought for the Union, any troop movement. And then there was the, the truth about the Lutheran Church and Signal Tower and the legend, which you don't even have to include if you don't want to. Um, well, when Meade, uh, Meade's headquarters were at Tawnytown before the Battle of Gettysburg, Meade had drawn a temporary line along Pipe Creek, he thought that if he was going to fight the South, that that would be the um, place that he would fight. But of course, things didn't work out that way. So we didn't become Gettysburg. Tonytown didn't become Gettysburg. But his headquarters were here. And of course, when uh, the, the battle began, uh, the end of June and the first part of July, um, the troops were moving uh, through, some of them through Tonytown. They were moving through all the towns in Carroll County. Um, Sickles uh, Corps came through, I think, the 30th, and um, then um, Hancock's troops came on the 1st of July. Um, when they found out that um, the battle had begun, um, at the forks of the road outside of Tawnytown, what we call the Harney Road, there's a big inn uh, where Dr. Swope lived at the time, and um, that was where Meade asked uh, Hancock to go and take over because Reynolds, who had come by way of Emmitsburg and then into, he was one of the first generals into uh, Gettysburg and of course killed shortly after he arrived. And so Hancock was sent to take care of him. Now the Harney Road um, was a supply route um, for, uh, for things being taken up to the battle. Um, and um, there were about, I think, 
in excess of 67,000 troops that went back and forth, uh, you know, before and during and after the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, the Lutheran Church Tower was used as a signal tower. That's documented. Um, there were, of course, concentrated troop movements at Antrim, and um, it's not unlikely that that could have been used in some way, but we don't have documentation for that. But it's kind of like a legend that 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 um, that lookout might have been used. Okay. Uh, Post Civil War, what was the economy like? Uh, did it still remain active farming and agribusinesses with canneries? And they were tiny towns. Oh, right after right after the Civil War, things kind of like were static. It wasn't until that railroad came in in 1871 when things began to pick up again, and that's when, uh, when they knew the railroad was coming, that's when things started to expand. Okay, and you had, uh, you had canneries here in town, there were uh, town and town peaches? Well, there, yes, there were canneries, um, there was an A.W. Fieser cannery company, and then there was a smaller one, uh, and they, I think they did corn. Um, the A.W. Fieser had several plants. They had one in Tawnytown, one in uh, Kemar, one in Silver Run, and they did different uh, things. The Tawnytown plant mostly did corn and peas, I believe. Um, and then I had three cigar factories down here, and you know where I found Yeah, them? There, they were. Okay, there, were there were some two, two cigar factories, um, and um, I guess... I don't, I don't have too much information about them, but they were here. That's okay. Um, just tell me a little bit about the Carroll Re Record, which was published from 1894 to 1975. One, is it, was it one of the longest-running papers in the county, um, and was it one of the most important in keeping county residents informed? Um, the Carroll Record, um, I would say, was an important paper. I'm not sure it was the longest. I don't have uh, statistics on how long some of the other papers ran, but it, it did run for almost a hundred years, but not quite. Um, but the importance of the Carroll Record was that um, the editor, P.B. Engler, encouraged uh, neighboring communities to correspond or send uh, items of interest um, to the paper. And so every week you had um, an item from, let's say, um, Kemar or Keysville or uh, New Windsor, um, um, Union Bridge, um, Middleburg, they all had correspondence and they all sent information in. And so uh, the paper reached to them as well as just the tiny town residents. Of course, it also published um, not only local news but national and state news. And um, today, what we find interesting when we look at the old papers are the ads and the, the, the merchants that were in business at the time and the prices of the f of the food and the prices of the um, merchandise. Five cents for a loaf of bread? <laughs> yeah. Um, then just kind of during the um, 30s, 40s and, and kind of forward to that, there were some later uh, businesses like the Tawnytown Manufacturing. Yes, there was a, a Tawnytown Manufacturing Company that manufactured men's suits there was also one that did ladies' dresses, and um, the Cambridge Rubber Company, which was uh, during the war, uh, produced it, it produced a, a lot of uh, rubber products that were used by the troops, um, and it employed about 2,000 people at the height, I think, of their. Uh, they did have a fire, uh, the beginning near the beginning of the war. But they rebuilt and um, were able to supply uh, rubber type products like capes and boots and that sort of thing for troops. Um, let's get personal. <laughs> <laughs> You've lived here all your life. Describe what it was like growing up in uh, Tawnytown as a young girl. Growing up in Tawnytown was uh, fun. Uh, we didn't have a lot of the problems that we have today. Things were more relaxed. Um, there, were, there was not television. We had radios, of course. We're not, I'm not that ancient. But um, we, 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 um, we had fun, like in the wintertime, we had fun sledding. The roads were not 
um, that well-traveled. Um, I lived on Frederick Street, and we uh, the plows would come by and pack the snow down. It was just a, t a dual highway at the time and not much traffic, but um, we would use spotters, and we would start down at Memorial Lane on Frederick Street, and if we had a really good um, packed snow, we could go all the way down past the Catholic Cemetery. Um, the uh, kids that lived up on York Street would start at um, Roberts Mill Road, and they could go down as far as the canning factories if they had a good slick uh, roadway. And we used spotters. You wouldn't do that today. You wouldn't use the roadways. A little bit later, they did. Uh, the town did block off Middle Street for the uh, children to use, like in the evenings. And they would go at the top of Roberts Mills Ro Road and down toward the rubber factory. And um, we had parties and um, picnics, and there were lawn fates, and uh, the fairs uh, belonged to the 4-H club. And, of course, we were uh, put entries into the, into the county fair, which was at Tawny Town. The fairgrounds were just outside the town where now is the shopping center. And um, in the summertime, we we had uh, we had picnics, and uh, for uh, we had a summer home along uh, Bear Branch. But during the war, we didn't. Uh, my father didn't have the gas, so we couldn't stay down there. But when we were there, we did swim a lot of swimming and that sort of thing. Um, we didn't have a library, but we had books, and we used to get um, ma buy magazines at McKinney's Drug Store. And, um, of course, there were ice cream parlors, and there was the movies that cost five or ten cents to go to the movies. So, um, and then later on, um, around the time of the war, or after the war, there was a drive-in movie. So, that was how we spent our time. But we didn't worry about um, burglars or things like that. We hardly, I don't believe people locked their doors um, Things were just, we invented games, we played um, uh, games on the sidewalk and uh, rode our bikes and skated, roller skated, that sort of thing. You also told me you had a unique job during the summer when you were in high school. Yes, I did. Uh, the boys, um, of course, were off work, uh, fighting the war and uh, male help was scarce so they hired me to they were doing, a, the, the state, I believe, was doing a survey of uh, the Japanese beetle pop population. And um, I had to go around, and I think I had something like maybe 50 to 100 traps, and it took me all week to go around and check the traps. I had to empty them and count these beetles by the court and then send a report to um, Westminster, too. Uh, but I got higher wages than the... Um, some of the kids that were working in the in the canning factories, I was getting paid sixty cents an hour, and they were getting paid forty cents an hour. Then, as a young adult, um, you know, maybe in your twenties, thirties, um, what kind of what job did you have here? Did you work? Um, what, how did the, had the town changed from when you were younger? Um, I I was away um, at school mostly um, as a young adult. Um, in the summertime, I went, I went to Notre Dame College in Baltimore, but in the summertime I went to uh, Baltimore each week to school because I was a piano major and I was taking uh, private lessons and studies at Peabody, so I traveled back and forth. So most of the things that we did were similar to what I've described before. We had this, one, of the, one of the things that, um, that we all enjoyed was the skating rink, and which was just outside of town, and going to Frizzleburg to the dairy because they had wonderful thick milkshakes, and everybody in the I think Carroll County knew about uh, Warner's Dairy milkshakes. Um, and then when you when, when you started to work here as, a, as an adult, what was what was your job? Well, I worked as a, I my first job in Carroll County. Well, I was a teacher in the Carroll County school system, and. Um, I taught fourth. I taught music first because I had a degree in music, and then I was certified in later certified in elementary, and I taught elementary, and then got certified in media, and I was a librarian for 25 years. So 
I started the first elementary library at William Winchester. That was the first uh, school that had a, a library built into it. Other schools had um, rooms that were converted into libraries, but William Winchester was the first school that was built with a library planned. And when did you become interested in history? That you know? Well, I, I always was interested in history, but um, I, I guess being a librarian, um, you know, I was very interested in uh, especially reference questions, you know, that, that uh, students would bring. But um, while I was still teaching, I worked in the summertime as a volunteer in the library at the Historical Society. And I started doing research on my family. That's how I started out. And uh, then I got interested in doing um, other things, the history of the town. And I did a history of the church, St. Joseph's Church. And um, I, as I say, I worked on some of the other publications, the Atlas of Carroll County, the Northwest History of Carroll County, and um, some of the other publications from the society. Um, so how would you describe Tawny Town today? Is it still active in, in farming, um, new businesses? Tawny Town today, I don't think the farming is as um, outstanding as the light business. There's light businesses in town. Um, I think some of them, one is Evapco and FlowServe, um, and then there's another one that manufactures plastic fences, I think, out on uh, West or um, on the Emmitsburg Road, and uh, the Cambridge Rubber uh, Factory has been torn down, and some of the buildings were saved, and small businesses have gone into there. And then, of course, there's Tawny Stairs um, that's um, out on uh, 194, and I believe some other businesses around there. I believe there's a plan out there that, uh, that recycles uh, cardboard. Um, do you think that uh, Tawny Town will stay kind of a relatively rural, um, close-knit community? Well, we're we're hoping uh, that it will. Um, of course, we've become a bedroom community for commuters uh, to surrounding uh, towns or cities, like Baltimore. Even people travel down to Washington, but um, we're trying to. That the town has, of course. Uh, under have been under the the main the old what we call the old town, we've been working on for several years. We're a Main Street community. We're in the National Register of Historic Places. Um, our architecture uh, on the Main Street is uh, well documented. A lot of people that own property along the way have received grants to do facade um, work, and um, the town is beginning to look uh, look differently. They've encouraged uh, businesses to come back from, uh, you know, the, when the shopping center started up, uh, the downtown businesses um, lacked um, customers. So they're encouraging people to come and start businesses in the old town. Um, so we're hoping that uh, we've done a lot to encourage uh, an interest, uh, the people that have moved here, to be interested in what what they what the heritage of the town that they are now living in was like. Um, the Heritage Committee and the museum are, are two examples of um, efforts to 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 drive this uh, along. Um, the museum, of course, offers exhibits of, uh, and we offer tours too, of the downtown. We have self-guided tours. We have guided tours that the Heritage Committee gives. And um, recently, um, this spring, one of the school groups um, took a tour of uh, the museum, and I believe downtown, uh, and were very um, enthusiastic about what they learned about some of the buildings that they had just dri driven by and just didn't pay too much attention to. But now, after the tour, it meant much more to them, and they had an entirely different outlook about what they were, what what their town was all about. Why do you think that uh, preservation is so important? We've lost, 
your 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 ancestors it's it's too bad we've already lost a lot of uh, we wish that we had more um, knowledge of what the town what happened in the town uh, during the time of the Civil War but a lot of people maybe that kept diaries or whatever um, they're not they're no longer in existence so they don't we don't know t uh, you know too much about people in the civil people living here in the Civil War uh, for example we have no documentation about churches being used uh, for hospitals, except uh, uh, one reference, uh, Maggie Maring, that uh, that went to school in um, New Windsor, wrote that a friend of hers told her, a friend from Tawny Town, said that they were using the churches for uh, hospitals. But we have no documentation other than that one remark. And um, we're trying to put together the Heritage Committee right now, is trying, me in particular, trying to get um, some material together to write down some of the things that people that happened to people locally uh, during the time of the Civil War. But so far, um, we don't have too much material. If there's anybody out there that has material, we'd be glad to to know about it. But I think it's important to for you to know about your past um, because um, it's a shame to lose contact with uh, what what went before. It means much more to you today if you know what people went through in order for you to uh, now be uh, enjoying the, the town, for example. Last question. It may sound like a corny question, but uh, why do you think, just personally, why do you think uh, Carroll County is such a great place to live? It's still rural. It's still... It, say, you say Carroll County. Carroll County is still, still rural. I hope that we don't lose any more farmland or, of course, we have preservation in place, which is great. But um, it's, I hate to see um, the county change too much and um, it's, it's, that's why people are moving, people move out of the city and come to the county because they want a more um, relaxed type of living. 